of the Dennis Report, I'm Dennis Atchison. A major narrative in our province is healthcare delivery. Today's guest, with his 50 years plus experience, is going to offer where key tipping points are in the system and where solutions can be achieved. If only we could let go of the old ways of doing things and embrace examples from other provinces and implement them here. It'll take political will and leadership. And our guest, Ken McGeorge, speaks to both of those with much passion, knowledge, and wisdom. If you like the work we do, please support the show by clicking the link to Patreon or making comments, and please share. And now for Mr. McGeorge. Thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. And we can begin with a recent announcement by the provincial government to privatize parts of um, the extramural hospital system. Um, maybe to help our audience, do a quick background on why that would be of interest to you. Well, I've spent over 50 years in the healthcare field, running large hospitals, large, running uh, large uh, nursing homes, uh, el elder care facilities like the York Care Center. And I've also worked in small rural facilities in very rural Ontario. Okay. So I, I've got a fair grasp of uh, how the system works and what its strengths and weaknesses are. In this province, I was part of the original uh, restructuring of the hospital system back in the early 90s. Okay. And uh, so, oh yeah, and then I, I spent a couple of years, four altogether, in different segments working in the civil service. So I've seen both sides of the, of the equation here. So, yeah, I, I remember way back in the early 70s when I was a young buck in the in the system in Nova Scotia um, contracting services out to the private sector was it was the rage that was just the way hospitals did it in those days and food service was contracted out cleaning was contracted out uh, later on a variety of other services and the reason they did that was that <clears throat> healthcare you know, what hospitals are all about is healing the sick and looking after emergencies and caring for people in distress. And in the early days, certainly they were not really good at developing leaders, developing leadership, developing management skills. And, um, and so back in those days, um, it, it was sensible to contract out because what you were buying was uh, the ability of some of these corporations to manage better than we could within the system. Yeah, you're ma you're hiring managers, and the system is geared to service delivery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so, in the old days, when we would hire, we would contract with a cleaning corporation. You're, you're not talking about your local corner cleaning company, where you're talking about these multinational firms that. Mm. Uh, I mean, these people uh, and these organizations had tons of research going on best practice. What are the best products? What's the best equipment to use? Uh, what's the most efficient methodology to use for uh, cleaning and on and on? So you weren't just buying management. You were buying best practice. You were buying corporate know-how, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. So fast forward now to, to where we are. Um, in New Brunswick, we, we've, we've not been all that great, frankly, at developing uh, rock-solid management skills. We've done pretty well in the, in the clinical areas, um, but it hasn't. Developing management and management skills and leadership, frankly, hasn't been a high priority in the system. And that's one of the things that has bothered me as a professional because I, I spent many, many years um, in leadership development and, and taking every possible course and seminar and workshop and yep. reading all the literature. And I, when I was in the prime of my career, my job was to grow and develop uh, people that uh, worked with me. Um, so with this situation, I can, I can understand how perhaps the Department of Health, um, desperate for ways to conserve funds, desperate for ways to make things more efficient, might be attracted 
<clears throat> to a company coming along and saying, hey, we can do this a lot better than you. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no idea what the interactions were between Medivy and Department of Health, but obviously somebody has convinced somebody else that, um, that there's a win-win here somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, the choke point for me, the thing that has bothered me, because people who know me um, understand that certainly in the last decade I've really become interested in elder care, aging care in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really, really heart attack proud of what we did at your care center in, <clears throat> in turning the organization around and creating a, a true center of excellence, which actually even today is uh, being looked at not just within the province, but outside the province. Yeah. So it becomes another example of something that Little New Brunswick does really well, and other people are coming to take a look at how we did it. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> absolutely. we don't hear about. No, right. That, and that's what happened to us at, at your care center. In building that, that organization, um, we reached out to Baycrest in Toronto, which is a world-class organization, and they have tentacles all over the world, literally. Um, and we reached out to Maimonides in Montreal, which is same thing. They have tentacles all over the place. And as a result of that, your care center then became affiliated with organizations all over North America, and, and well beyond that, actually. The reach uh, has been over into the Netherlands and elsewhere where we've brought people in to, to do various things with us. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that shows, showed to me and showed to our board what, what can be done uh, if you set your mind to it. Um, I'm not sure that, um, well, I know for sure that there is not a province-wide similar commitment. Mm -hmm. um, there are centers of excellence. There's, we, we did some of that good stuff there, and other, there are some other facilities in this province that are just really doing some absolutely phenomenal stuff and similarly gaining uh, national recognition. Um, so, so the intersection then with the government's recent decision yeah. to privatize part of the, the administration side of the extramural system, is there an intersection with um, senior care facilities and that extramural structure? Well, there is in the sense that, um, you know, for, for the last 10 years in working with elders, the thing that, that I've become and others have become painfully aware of is the real challenge of keeping frail elders, persons with dementia, person, uh, and seniors with other chronic diseases, keeping them living safely at home. Mm -hmm. Government has announced several times now in the last decade the Home First program, which is a wonderful program in theory, but it works only to the extent that the extramural and the home support people and the assessment process, all of that works together like a clock. Extramural has, has been known to run very well. I mean, it's the pride of New Brunswick, frankly. Yep. Um, and um, the home support piece has been the piece that has been missing, has been a, a really difficult challenge, has never really been fixed, and must be fixed. And so when I looked at and I heard about the government's decision to uh, to uh, pri to contract out the management of extramural, I thought, you picked the wrong piece. You ought to contract out the home support. It wasn't the priority from your view. Not Something else is the priority. Yeah, and, and they've attacked half the package. Okay. Keeping people safe at home requires a well-run extramural for sure, mm -hmm. but that whole home support and all that goes with that needs to be really well, well organized, um, well financed. Um, <clears throat> And we've known about that for how many decades? Yes. And we've talked about it in spades at the, at the New Brunswick Council on Aging that we worked for a full 12 months thrashing out priority issues, and that certainly was one of them. So implementation becomes a problem. Sounds like it's research. Sounds like there's answers to the research. Now it just 
time to put it in gear and something's stopping it. Yeah. It, is the stopping it money? Is the stopping it um, just political will? I think it's political will. Uh, I, I, Gee, you would think politically that would be advantageous to go fix a problem. You would think so, but uh, they, I, I, from my interactions with the policymakers, they, they have this great fear that everything like that is going to cost them a fortune. And it's true that there needs to be some resource put into the home support piece. But more than anything, good, rock-solid organization needs to be put in there and leadership. And that's been, in my judgment, and in the judgment of many other people, I might add, mm -hmm. has been the missing piece. So as you describe that and you talk about maybe the inhibition is uh, costs, and politically they see that as a problem because you're running up health care costs. The flip side of that, and one of the common narratives we have from media, sure. is, is about um, seniors being a tsunami on the expenses and the drain on the province, which is another theme I want to get into later. Um, the issue in hospitals of people who need to be in another care facility, but they're stuck in a hospital, which that's the last place they want to be. Absolutely. So that systemic um, dominoes, and it's like, here's the dominoes all lined up, and then there's a gap. And then it, the whole thing stops somehow. So there must be a counter argument somewhere that the savings you will generate in other parts of the complicated system, if you do focus on taking care of the home care first piece, th that must have surfaced somewhere. Yeah, it might look like it's expensive here, but over there we're going to save this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Has that come up at all? The, the, the rest, oh, the yeah. full circle of the, the economic flow? Sure, it keeps, uh, it keeps coming up. But there seems to be, you know, somebody has to make the first move. And, and there seems to be a paralysis, I think, in making. And I think one of, the, one of the issues, and again, I'm speaking very personally, mm -hmm. based, but based on my experience over the last 50 years and 10 years here in long-term care, um, the people who make the rules are wonderful, wonderful people. Heart attack intelligent, I mean, really intelligent people, um, good people, very, very caring people. But that's what they do. They make the rules. They don't administer the rules. They're, they're, there's a whole um, um, gap between the people that make the rules and the people that actually have to play by the rules. An experience gap. Yeah. And so when you aren't out there implementing, um, and you're charged with the mandate of fixing some element like the home care piece, mm -hmm. you might be tempted to think that everything's going to cost a bucket of money and I better, better not uh, start that. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration. Um, in the long-term care field, um, in, the, in, the, in the nursing home system, for instance, um, <clears throat> absenteeism, and workers' compensation claims have been very, very costly um, for many, many reasons. Um, and there are all kinds of policies, procedures, systems that, are, that have been written down telling people how to manage better in both of those areas. When we are at your care center, we were really keen to figure out because we were in, in 2006, our numbers were not that good. Absenteeism, uh, workers' comp claims, and that then contributed to a morale and culture issue within the organization. Yes. So after a process of consultation with staff and unions, and we, we spent a lot of time getting people on board as to what were the real issues and how do we go about fixing them, we chose to embark not on some new policy direction, but on changing the culture, creating a workplace that uh, was appealing to people. We, we used to say to employees, when you, when you wake up in the morning, you really need to look forward to coming here. And we hope you'll look forward to coming here. And, and my undertaking as a CEO was to do everything I can do to make your work experience here uh, rewarding, exciting, uh, fulfilling, and and so we worked together hard on that, the unions and management. 
And guess what? Our absenteeism plummeted. Uh, workers' comp claims dropped off hugely, huge drop. And the overall uh, atmosphere, if you, we did a number of employee surveys, but just from talking with people, talking with families, suddenly we had raving fans on our hands. So, but that didn't happen by following somebody's new policy statement or policy <laughs> directive. It happened by actions of the heart. Yes. On the part of the union leadership, on the part of the management, um, and, and the employees. So just to give you a touch of a breather, great story um, for indicators of where change comes from. There's a great piece by Donella Meadows from the late 90s now. It's about points to intervene in a system and where you can create change. Complicated problems, systemic challenges, and we tend to have a project mindset when we go at them, yeah. like a funding strategy. Sure. Um, She'll show you in, in this 30-page document, number nine or the weakest indicator for change is any time you use numbers. Yeah. So you try to win the argument or change based on budgets yeah. or stats. Number one is heart. Yeah. When you get everyone into that same space, Absolutely. the change you're looking for happens. Absolutely. And you've, you've experienced it. Oh, precisely. See, I was brought up in, a, in an environment. My, my dad was an old-time preacher. Uh, pastor of very successful churches. Every church that he pastored grew, and it grew just by virtue of what he did, uh, the heart and soul that he poured into it. And um, so in my professional life, I've tried to borrow that um, and read some other management books that confirmed yeah. the kind of leadership that he showed. And yeah, I mean, it's all, everything rises or falls on leadership, and that's really what it's all about. Sports makes a nice analogy for that, too. There are some great teams who all have almost the same heart, breathe, heart rate and the yeah. breathing cadence, you know. Sure. They might not have all the talent and the best playbook or the best strategy, but they've got that going for oh, them. Oh, absolutely. It transfers over. Even in building community, it transfers over. Yeah. And um, that's exactly what has to be done. That, that was the approach that, my co-chair, Dr. Suzanne Dupuis Blanchard, and I took as we were leading the uh, New Orleans Council on Aging last year. We, because both of us have the best interests of elders in our heart, she as a nurse, me as a CEO, um, that was the perspective we were coming at it from. We wanted to create, cre as a matter of fact, in the report, you'll see reference to changing the culture. You see that repeatedly in the report. Yep. Yep. Great. Um, let's slide into that a little bit because sure. uh, we defer too much to media, such as it is in New Brunswick, for creating our narratives. Mm. Um, and, and to cut some slack for media, they might not have the budget or the time, the research ability or resources to be aware of the messaging that they're sending out every time they portray seniors or elders in a negative light, yeah. that tsunami of seniors are going to suck up all the health care costs, when in fact it's a percentage of a percentage that needs that attention. And so, so can you describe for us New Brunswick's tableau or mosaic of, of seniors in this province? Because they do an awful lot. There's a lot positive in contributing and then over here, there's this small percentage that is in intensive need and support and, and such. So economic, economists might say it's an asset rather than a liability. I hate that phrasing, but you sure. know, that sense of that. Mm -hmm. your, your study and your work must lead you right down that path about all the talent, skill sets, knowledge, wisdom we have. Oh, absolutely. Well, to begin with, uh, we... Too many people use the term tsunami, and I have used it. Um, the reality is that in New Brunswick, we have the, the oldest population in the, in the country. I think last year we were tied with Nova Scotia. I'm not sure who has pulled ahead in either direction yeah. recently, but um, that means we have a much larger percentage of elders than other provinces. That, and what goes with getting old is is frail frailty and chronic diseases and things of that nature, which as you get older, they're more complex to, to deal with. And uh, many, many frail seniors will have multiple chronic 
illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes a problem if you're not organized to manage it. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem in New Brunswick. We just are not organized to manage it. Uh, what happens is that uh, people, um, they want to stay home, they want to be looked after in their own home, so they've got a, a son or a daughter or a neighbor or somebody who is their caregiver and they're able to survive at home okay for a while. But at, at some point in their, in their life, <clears throat> that becomes um, uh, too much of a challenge for the caregiver and eventually the family is in crisis and they end up in, in the emergency department. Um, how much better would it be if those folks were managed not in your typical family doctor's office, but in a senior's um, health clinic, a senior's primary care center, where staff was, were specifically trained to manage chronic diseases, specifically managed to uh, train to d deal with elders, mm -hmm. had additional training in dementia and all of the other um, issues of, of aging. Um, and a lot of that care doesn't have to be given by the family doctor. I mean, a lot of that care can be managed and, and provided by nurse practitioners, by uh, social workers, by a variety of care professionals. And you always will need the family doctor, but not in each and every visit. Yeah. And is, is that a, a bottleneck in the system? It's a huge bottleneck. I talk with, with um, elders almost daily, talking with some folks over the weekend who uh, live in one city here in this province, and they, they need regular medical intervention by virtue of some uh, diseases of aging. Mm -hmm. So they, they live in one city where they get their episodic care is given at an after-hours clinic, but their primary care, their family doctor, is in another city 90 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. Well, how much sense does that make? Mm -hmm. And there are models in the country, Linda Lee in, uh, in Ontario, she's a beautiful, wonderful young family physician. She started the Linda Lee Clinic targeted at this kind of population group. And my goodness, there are over 100 such clinics scattered around Ontario now. Um, in Winnipeg, uh, at the Health Science Complex, there's the prime model, which targets specifically persons with, with dementia mm -hmm. and um, seeks to keep them out of trouble. Um, but uh, all too often we hear cases like the one I referred to, or you hear about uh, seniors locally who have multiple conditions, chronic conditions, and they don't even have a family doctor. Well, I'm sorry, in, in this day and age, in New Brunswick, with the number of physicians we have, the amount of money that the province is investing in health care, it's inexcusable for 20,000 people to not have a family doctor. That's, that's, that's barbaric. And, but, but, but we have yet to develop uh, a system of primary care that uh, is really relevant and efficient for that segment of the population. Consequently, folks get into crisis, they end up in the hospital, and once they get into the hospital, the, the care they get, the staff do their best with what they have, but it isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we need to have a big gathering and put everyone in the room together and say, figure it out because we have all of the pieces. They're just not put together very well, and the result is the person who needs the service gets runs into all the log jams, and that becomes their experience, rather than the system really took care of them because the system had flow to it or had let go of some authority and deferred the authority to some other thing. So well, can I argue with you a little bit? Sure. Um, to my way of thinking, in the, last, in the last decade for sure, we have had lots of gatherings. Okay. And at every gathering, people say pretty much the same things. Yeah, perfect and, world and, and we've been saying it for how many years now? Yep. 
and the Council on Aging report hits on each of each of these issues uh, and presents a way out. Present, presents the basics of a plan for coherent um, care and services for an aging population. Well, the missing link is leadership, in my opinion. Okay. When I was at your care center <clears throat> as the CEO <clears throat> earlier in this decade, um, in 2010, we had discovered the prime model in Winnipeg. And uh, the diagnosis and care of persons with dementia is one of the serious, rock solid, serious healthcare issues in, in this province, in every, every province, throughout the Western world. Mm-hmm. We, we saw the prime model and said, my goodness, that's, it may not be magic, but it certainly is better than what we have. So let's, why don't we try to get a pilot project going and test it? and see how it works. So we had five doctors signed on to work with us. Uh, they were the ones whose staff, uh, there are medical staff at your care center. And um, we had a, a lot of interest, a lot of support. We had the people involved with um, the leadership of extramural in this region, very interested and keen. So we put a little proposal together. It wasn't very detailed. And, and just asked the Department of Social Development, could we undertake, could we commence a conversation, which would lead to a plan, but at least could we get in the same room and have a conversation about this and see, see if we can agree on a way forward. The conversation never happened, and this is 2017. Hmm. And uh, now York Care Center in the meantime has developed a, a seniors day program but it isn't the what makes the prime model different is that it it really um, responds to all the needs of keeping these people safe and comfortable at home what you're describing brings to mind a past interview with david alston who talked about as he learns government he's the uh, unofficial entrepreneur in residence it's a volunteer position so mm-hmm. Systems thinker. Yep. When looking at him, he's, uh, at the government, as he watched the strategic planning of the current government, he's, he dawned on him that there was no research and development department. Yep. The, so we're asking government to change when they don't have the tool or mechanism to figure out how to change. Exactly. Um, so he suggested that he did this with his hands. It comes from an outside entity that has the mandate and the authority yep. <laughs> to do the pilot project. So it sounds like if you and David were here right now, um, you're already that pilot project or your care facility was. It it just never took root. Because that's one of those bigger questions that looms for the province in several different sectors. We say we're small. We say we're adaptable. We say we can change. And then it gets stuck. And the stuck point tends to be the same spot all the time, either political will or civil service that is so atrophied because of political interference or whatever agenda's in there. Second quick point, when Blaine Higgs was here for an interview just a couple months ago, he talked about wanting to le- to deliver systemic change through the civil service. Yeah. Maybe the time is finally arriving, um, whether it's that political party or but just the fact that he even mentioned it was yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> You're starting to recognize that you know the solution is a systemic change. Yeah. Do you have thoughts like, is it possible? Is there hope that we can actually have a civil service that can be adaptable, um, find new projects and implement them? Because you've lived it for seven years. Well, no, absolutely. Uh, And I think it is possible, but not without leadership. Somebody's got to say, this is the way we're going and let's go. In our Council on Aging report, In several sections, we talked about the need for culture change. Mm -hmm. And in this province, in this field, we need change in the culture of aging. And specifically, we need to create a culture of innovation. The reason Linda Lee in Ontario was able to start one clinic and have it mushroom into 100 clinics, actually 120 now, I believe, scattered around Ontario, and that's all within two or three years. Goodness is because there is a culture there of innovation. When I worked in Ontario, which I did for most of my career, actually, 
uh, I worked in Ontario, Nova Scotia, and then here. In both those provinces, there was a whole different culture in healthcare. You know, in both provinces, and specifically in Ontario, uh, the Department of Health was was really very adept at bringing people like us from the field into policy decisions and policy uh, recommendations. I remember sitting on multiple uh, committees, one very high powered one at the Department of Health in Ontario, when there was a huge issue around funding of high tech surgery. And you're talking hundreds of millions, you're not talking peanuts. Mm -hmm. And we were able, after about six months, um, it was only about nine or ten of us around the table, half government, half us practitioners, and we were able to come up with a funding formula that made government happy because it had predictability. It made us happy because it had predictability and money. And deliverability. And, and deliverability. And within months we had the problem solved that had been going on for, for quite a while. In this province, we need to learn um, how to engage between civil service and the service provider service providers that, that uh, for instance the the for as long as i've been here in this field for the last 10 years you know more than 10 years actually um the issue of the assessment of persons who require care has been on the table. It's been a problem. It still is a problem to this day. I was in a nursing home yesterday where they were decrying the current state of the assessment process. Um, how many times has that been reviewed in the last 10 years? Probably two or three different times. How many times has the system been engaged in that review? None that I'm aware of. There has been a bit of a review in the last few months in the wake of our Aging Council report. But, and I heard the consultation process described, those of us who were there from the field really didn't feel like it got at the, the real issues. And so, and it's not because they're bad people on either side of the, the river here, it's just that we are on both different sides of the river and we need to um, learn how to I mean they make the rules we apply them so we need to get making an application together in some sense of collaboration not in headbutting. Why don't we slide into your work with um, aging in the um, provincial age committee if I've got that right. The Aging Council. Aging Council. Yeah. And, and, you know, we can always have some fun with that about sure. you got to be a certain age before you can qualify <laughs> and some of that. But, sure. But the, the issues and themes you have to touch on are powerful and yep. truly important. Sure. Like, like important in a soul level way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let me tell you why I got involved. <clears throat> First of all, I got involved in long-term care in New Brunswick by accident. Um, I had been, my most recent job, I was working in Ontario, northwestern Ontario, in a rural community, actually, and having a, a wonderful time learning, learning all about rural health, which is something we also need to talk about. And um, <clears throat> came back here because my daughter needed us and our, and our in-laws were aging. And so my wife and I were the sandwich generation back 2005, 6, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. And so at about that time, your care center was about to, just embarking on a major, major re reconstruction, um, which eventually ended up costing $44 million in construction um, contracts and, and all that went with that. <clears throat> so um, I knew some people on the board, they called me and asked me if I'd like to help them out. And so I I went and signed on a two-year management contract as CEO, which then morphed into, it was about a 10-year relationship that I had with them. Um, and, and so suddenly, starting in January 1, 2006, I'm immersed right up to here 
in aging care issues. Mm. So, uh, seeing up close and personal the difficulty that families were encountering with uh, primary care for their loved ones. <clears throat> we were living it at home with my in-laws uh, and my father-in-law had Alzheimer's and, and so we had to live through that process and so I was able to see it at home and then go to work and see it some more. And then through our re our resident family interactions, which were legion, um, I heard all kinds of stories. And, and of course, the the prevailing story, the consistent themes, well, they were consistent. The themes were, uh, how do you ever figure out who to talk to about how to get care and how to get service and how to get support? and Department of Social Development is, is such a big uh, morass, and how do you penetrate? Where do you get, where do you get into that, and where do you learn about benefits, and on and on and on. So we, um, and then we would also hear, I heard, over and over the challenges that families were having at the primary care level, where there was really grossly inadequate understanding, not just with physicians, but at all levels of primary care, uh, misunderstanding, lack of understanding of dementia and its many, many manifestations, how to manage dementia, the various phases of dementia, the various types of dementia, on and on and on. And uh, I remember hearing <clears throat> people talk about having to go into their family doctor's office and, 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 and have a meltdown be, before they could get some c communication going. And that's, so fast forward then, uh, I took great heart when Dr. McLaughlin under the Tory government was uh, named as chair of a uh, seniors advisory panel and he did some stellar work. His, his group put together quite a report. He had some great people around the table um, then there was a change of government, and of course, any time there's a change of government, the new government wants to ignore the past and move on with their own. And so I, one day out of the blue, I got a call from uh, the Minister of Social Development, Kathy Rogers, who was a, just a stellar person of character, and I, I came to really um, respect her a lot. She said, um, <clears throat> we're going to put this council together, and we'd like you to be the co-chair. Or one of the co-chairs and she told me who she was appointing as the other co-chair and I said well on one condition I've seen many of these reports come and go just in the short time I've been in New Brunswick there have been two before this um, one in 2007 I think and then John McLaughlin's report so promise me this isn't going to be one more glossy that's going to sit on somebody's shelf and gather dust like all the rest of them do. No, we mean business. We're going to make some change here. And so um, so we started about our work and we had uh, a great team of civil servants, wonderful people. Everybody, everybody uh, put their heart and soul into this. There were 17 people from around the province who, who uh, came together pretty much every month, sometimes more than once a month. And um, and really did some hard thinking and lots of lots of homework. So it wasn't just coming to a meeting; it was studying a whole bunch of stuff before yeah. you got there and a whole bunch afterwards. And and uh, so we were and we covered the waterfront in that in that council. Um, and uh, when you go online and look at the various recommendations, you can see that. When we showed it to the stakeholders that were gathered on January 27th at the convention center, these are people who have been chopping at the bit to see change, and they were just salivating. And when they looked at it, they all said, wow, you, you've covered the waterfront here. Sure hope there will be follow-up. Mm. So that's that's how I get into it and that's why I get into it because I I was really really committed to seeing because I'd seen these themes been going on and on and on meanwhile you got the hospital full of 
you know, 30, 40, sometimes as many as 80 beds of the Chalmers filled with frail elders, and that's no place for a frail elder, not, not on a good day. Yep, yep. So that's where we are. So the next <coughs> phase is the, what you just touched on comes up during many of the interviews on the show. It's like we've studied it, we know, and for some reason the change never follows. And one of the pushbacks on that is that four-year election cycle and that shift, if there is a shift in government, and how it gets reset. So one of the themes that needs to surface is how do we get the next political generation to recognize their responsibility isn't about changing all of the work done, but more about implementing it. That must have been present as the committee did its work, or even in your very beginning, of saying, well, promise me this isn't another study that sits yeah. on a shelf. We've done that with poverty. We've done that with some economics. Yeah. Um, farming isn't even on the radar for the larger provincial narrative, and yet we need security of food supply, yeah. which ties into health and wellness yeah. very quickly. Um, so do you have any thoughts being, uh, you know, 50 years working in, in that environment, being in two other locations where the changes do occur, there is an ability to innovate or implement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have some pointers for us? Oh, about absolutely. Here and here. Yep. <laughs> Not that I haven't thought about it. <laughs> um, Jeffrey Simpson describes healthcare in Canada as, as Canada's third rail in Canadian politics. And so it is, it's tough. I mean, I learned that the hard way when we did regionalization back in the early 90s. And these small communities would, with, with justification, get pretty upset when you came in and announced you were going to cut beds and lay off staff and all of this. Because, and that's what we went in with. We didn't go in with a plan. We went in with cuts. A cutback strategy, yeah. In the province of Ontario, they, they have had... Uh, similar issues, both in long-term care and in their acute care system, and similar four-year election cycles, and um, and so there came a point, and I'm I'm not sure who was the premier, who was the prevailing government at the time, but it was back in the '90s, mid '90s, I believe it was, when the light came on. And somebody somewhere said, we're never going to fix any of this stuff so long as we're tied to the four-year election cycle. We need to get this out of the legislature, out of the political arena, and let some highly respected people who know more about this than we do um, deal with it. So they set up what they call the Health Care Restructuring Commission. And it was chaired by Dr. Dunk Sinclair, who was a friend of mine back in the early 90s. He was the dean of the Queen's University Medical School. Interesting, he was a veterinarian by profession. Um, we used to joke with him about that, but he, brilliant, brilliant guy. <coughs> Actually, one of his sons was a, is a member of the Tragically Hip, which is kind of interesting. But Dunk, um, Dunk is a brilliant guy, uh, great communicator, great debater. And, and very sensitive. And so he gathered around him some people of the same caliber who really had the best interests of the province, best interests of healthcare at heart. And they created a plan for <clears throat> the distribution of uh, services and facilities in the province. So anytime after that, and they still do, <clears throat> when the politicians are faced with issues, they can point back to the restructuring com commission and they can say, that's that's where this decision came from. So don't blame me, you can blame those guys. Yeah. Because they knew a whole lot more than we do. And they could probably give a better answer. To yeah. yeah. So they came up with an evidence-based, sensible, coherent plan. See, in this province, that happened back in the early 90s when McKenna was premier. There had been a number of studies going back to 1970s, actually, Llewellyn Davies Weeks and others, calling for significant change in how hospitals and, and nursing homes were built and, and run <coughs> in New Brunswick. And so he set about a two-stage um, healthcare restructuring plan 
and that was announced in 1992, March, by Dr. Russell King. And phase one was what was implemented. Phase two fell off the table. Uh, and phase two should have stayed on the table, but I think getting through phase one was pretty challenging, politically and otherwise. Um, and um, I think maybe perhaps public policy people, politicians, uh, got a little bit spooked. And so we've not heard of phase two of healthcare reform since then. But it's time to get it back on the table. Great. Um, can you slide into this uh, piece of written work that you've been um, putting together for a period of time and, and share with us what, what you've been working on? Yeah, well, <clears throat> when, you're, when you're actively engaged in the health system, uh, you have to be a little careful of what you say and how you say it and how frank you are, because at the end of the day, you have a salary and a pension that you have to worry about and mm -hmm. continued employment that you have to worry about. Um, last year, I was 72 when I retired for the fourth time. And I thought, you know what? Um, I owe nobody anything. Um, and I'm not dependent on anybody for my income per se. And there's some elephants in the room that need to be talked about and, and need to be laid out. Um, public policy issues around health and social services. And so I'm just going to take a crack at putting my 50 years of experience um, on paper, particularly as it relates to New Brunswick. But that is the role of the elder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, I sat down last winter and crafted, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. Just before that, before the last provincial election, CBC had asked me to, do, to create a, a piece for um, their website, which I did. <clears throat> And in that, I, create, I presented a five-part formula for correcting issues in healthcare. It was a five-part plan, broad strokes. And um, it got some, some uptake, but not, not an awful lot. But it was on their website for a while. Mm -hmm. That came as a result of um, a think tank that I had been involved with at at St. Thomas University with Dr. Tom Bateman and, and many others. And we had met for about six months just to, just to do some blue sky thinking about if you were the Minister of Health or the, if you were the Premier and you didn't have to worry about getting reelected, what would you do to correct the health system? And so I took some of that thinking and put it in, in that essay. So last winter I took that piece and said, all right, we're going to elaborate here just a little bit. And so I, and I was asked by Stu, to, to, by one of the professors, if I would do that. And so I did. And <coughs> what, I, what I did in the first draft was document a lot of the history of the evolution of healthcare in this province to begin with, going back way before back to Llewellyn Davies Weeks and actually before that, and certainly touched on the impact that Louis Robichaud's policies had and equal opportunity and whatever have you. And then of course, <clears throat> 1992 being a big banner year in healthcare with the, with the regionalization of hospitals, uh, traced it from there as well and showed how you know, at various points in the, in the system, there have been wonderful plans but then there have been elections, and quite often at time of elections, um, the plans will get changed. And I understand that. That's practical politics. Yeah. For instance, in 1993, the Region 3 Hospital Corporation, that was managing all the hospitals from, uh, from Plasterock down to McAdam and Minto, 
um, created a plan for the organization of hospital services within within the region and defined roles for the small community hospitals and whatever have you. Um, but unfortunately, that plan didn't stand the test of the next election. And so we end up creating a hospital in, in Waterville, which is a beautiful facility, wonderful. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't part of the plan. Uh, that was done for other reasons. Um, so in in the essay that, I'm, that I've worked on, with, I've co collaborated now with one of the professors, at, uh, with Dr. Tom Bateman, because both of us believe that that uh, while while health care is, as Jeffrey says, Canada's third rail in politics, um, people really need to understand what some of the elephants are in the room uh, so that intelligent and wise decisions can be made on a go-forward basis. For instance, in this province, we <clears throat> every small community that has a a little hospital. I mean, they guard the hospital jeal jealously for many, many reasons. Mm -hmm. There are jobs there. Uh, it helps to attract and retain a doctor there. On and on and on. Many, many reasons. What I learned when I worked in northwestern Ontario was that you can retain that little hospital. But if you, if you have the right relationship with the big referral hospitals, you can create a regional health care system. You just knock your hat in the creek. When my wor wife and I worked up there and we moved there in 2001, boy, i got to be careful what I say. We were so impressed with the health care that we got, both at the primary level mm -hmm. and at the second. As a matter of fact, she had a a condition that required specialty assistance and specialty consult. She had been going to doctors around here for a couple of years. And because of the wonderful relationship between our little rural hospital and Winnipeg, she was able to get in, get that problem fixed within three months. And I'm thinking, and that was all because of the relationships that have been established between little rural and big urban. Mm -hmm. uh, and to give you a touch of a break, um, your interview two years ago, John McGarry was on. Yeah. Uh, at the time, he was still the CEO of, of uh, Horizon Health Network. Mm -hmm. He talked with much enthusiasm, like you were just pointing out, about how New Brunswick's perfectly structured for a regional health care delivery model. Absolutely. The obstacles were the old school values of, I need a hospital in my community. So he, he identified the direction to go, he identified with the obstacle, and there was no opportunity during that conversation to get into how do we help citizens relax about having a hospital in their community let the healthcare in that building morph into something else, yeah. and have these centers where the referral system happens and there is a flow. At that time, the interview of the interview, um, St. Stephen Hospital was closing, yeah. and John maps out, uh, you know, some of the logic and math behind why this works. Um, media will never cover the fine details that help public education with the exercise. People feel that sense of loss for the hospital. Yeah. From, and have to relax or let go a bit to let the new process come in and actually is going to elevate your quality of care rather than you losing yep. quality of care. That is definitely one of the elephants in New Brunswick's healthcare narrative. Yep. <clears throat> but here's what we do wrong in New Brunswick that we did didn't we did not do wrong up there. In New Brunswick, uh, the reorganization of services has always been about taking away from the small hospitals. We always take away, we don't replace. Mm. Whereas in that environment, the little hospital, I, I was running a little hospital and a nursing home and an air ambulance and all of that stuff. And uh, and we, we gave wonderful post-operative cancer care there because we had a wonderful relationship with the regional center that said just as soon as that patient is done, 
he's coming right back to you by air ambulance and then you look after him thereafter but and and we were connected the the people from the regional center came out and trained our staff in various disciplines taught taught them new skills um so we weren't doing the big surgical interventions nor should we in a small way when, when you're doing surgical interventions boy you want to be in a place where you got lots of backup and lots of safety and yep yeah you don't want to be but that doesn't mean that the small rural hospital has no role as a matter of fact quite the opposite it can play a hugely important role we were doing scopes there we we're doing all kinds of wonderful things and and the local public they loved it they just absolutely loved it and so what i'm saying here in this environment is we need to change the narrative here we need to stop taking away <clears throat> uh, I, I suspect the people in St. Stephen, although I, I was only reading it through the newspaper, but I suspect it was a pretty negative thing for them. They were just seeing something disappear. Yes. And that isn't the way the game ought to be played. You ought to be, because there's a lot of wonderful healthcare stuff they can still be doing and doing safely yep. that will relieve the burden on the regional center. John explained that in his interview. Yeah. But, you know, it needs a certain amount of airplay and people oh, know yeah. how to find that because uh, mainstream yeah. media geared towards conflict most of the time or yeah. it's black and white not nuanced you know oh, not absolutely. shades of gray yeah. um do we have about five sub minutes left sure um do you have more elephants in the room you can share with us well because that's a key one you know that yeah. narrative needs to change let go of the old models because new models are actually going to get you what it is you're asking for in the first place sure uh, again coming back to the you know, it's all about leadership and the culture. Uh, the one area in this province that really still needs major, major improvement is primary care. Now, Anthony Knight, the CEO of the Medical Society, is doing a wonderful job in leading the medical profession through a change process. But... <clears throat> and, and, and there have been some innovations but what really would be helpful would be if government would would see their way clear to working with the willing and we were we were part of the willing at York Care Center to establish pilots don't wait don't wait for a province wide so this is the one thing in New Brunswick we in healthcare we kind of think like we have to have a one-size-fits-all mm. and um, and so we so that just allows us to do, do nothing mm -hmm. put off whereas uh, if we could just encourage people to um, whether it's in the field of primary care or in aging care dementia care try something for heaven's sakes and and let's measure it let's see that it works and what it when we have it debugged, then we'll roll it out across the province. Yep. So that would be my my big uh, primary care. I mean, everything rises or falls on leadership. Everything rises or falls on in healthcare on primary care, and 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 if the log jam is the access to a family doctor, you got to fix that log jam. And the younger doctors coming along today, they they don't want to practice. Like the uh, the guys of my vintage did. Uh, yep. Well, they can be millennials too, or Generation Y and X. They've got a different value set for the yeah, work absolutely. they do. Yeah. So uh, let's work with them in setting up some clinics, some other compensation models, um, multidisciplinary clinics. I mean, Sault Ste. Marie is a wonderful working model model of what can happen in that environment. It was the union that made it happen. And they got the doctors on site, and the rest is history. So, but it's it's so so difficult to get anybody with any authority to agree to do anything different in New Brunswick. It's it's painfully difficult, and so that would be my parting shot. <laughs> That's a good one, though. Yeah. But. but uh... Until we start bringing it to the surface and talking about it, it's just going to haunt us. Oh, yeah. uh, so when is your publication coming out? When do you anticipate? October. It? October. Yeah. And we're recording this in early September, so soon enough. Good. And then we see you all over the media with it, right? 
<laughs> that isn't my goal, but I, I do hope it starts a conversation. Yes. I hope people don't just trash it and bury it. I hope it. Uh, I hope there will be some wonderfully exciting, energized, um, intelligent debate. Great. Thank you so much for this. My pleasure. Indeed. Great. Yes, sir. Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, please support us. You can find links to Patreon. Share it. Make comments. That would be great. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. <laughs>